Chapter Four, Part Two of the Pathway of the Pioneer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pathway of the Pioneer by Dolph Willard. Chapter Four, Part Two. She did not write and tell either her mother or Nuzotra of this new acquaintance. Perhaps even at a distance she felt that strange influence that thrust her out into the desert as one of them, a creature forever set apart from its own kind and she craved for the warm human bliss of companionship and a dream fireside however homely twas but her womanhood with all its great capacities for bliss frank peyton had the impulse of all warm-hearted women to take the love offered her wherever and however she found it with the added and more dangerous excuse of making the best of her life and accepting that sphere in which she found herself he is not a gentleman she said to herself in self-defence as the months went on and made it impossible to shut her eyes to the point whither they were drifting but he is a good fellow and we think alike and feel alike and what use is it for me to hanker after the kind of position that mother had when i have to live amongst people like dick and never mix with any one else i have no social status and if i marry i had better take a good man than wait for the chance of some one with more questionable principles and greater polish but she knew in her piteous heart that she was denying her birthright and trying to disprove herself it was in church that dick jarred least and came nearest to her in every way his religion was of a very simple quality but it was the one subject on which he had thought and read a little and in spite of a provincial accent and commonplace words he managed to express the best part of himself to frank who like all generous natures glowed into enthusiasm in catching eagerly at the least reason for appreciation and raised poor dick to a pedestal where he posed oddly even in imagination when they stood side by side in the choir stalls and held the same hymn-book and felt their voices mingle and support each other frank found no implacable barrier to prevent her looking steadily to a long life with this same man beside her despite his limitations dick did not wear his dreadful ill-cut black coat on sunday either or the round hat that seemed to press out his ears to more than their usual evidence when they went for a sunday tramp it was an excuse for him to appear in harmless tweed a short jacket and knickerbockers which the vicar excused beneath the surplice and with a cap on his rough fair head he cut rather an admirable figure of urban strength and then at last there came a moonlight night as there does in all women's lives when the organist had played a voluntary from tomei's what does the french master of yearning and passion want with stealing his melodies among the abstract emotions of a congregation yet they will play him in sacred buildings and the anthem had been oh for the wings of a dove one unusually rich boy's voice rising and falling until frank struggled with the tears gathering in her eyes and felt dick's large rough hand close over her own with what seemed to her an inspiration of sympathy as a matter of fact they were merely two young people with a musical taste which made their emotions dangerously near the surface but by and by when they were walking home through the echoing streets of the broad old market town dick stopped suddenly and stammered with his own impulse frank dear i want you to promise to be my wife he said as suddenly as the words had overtaken him then there was the pause before the answering impulse in the woman's heart but nuzotra were very far away and the invalid mother with the gracious refined face and there was only the human nearness and dearness of dick's broad shoulders and the hand that was nervously clasping her arm under the old cloak she wore she could not see the coarse mould of the features in the shade of his tilted cap and perhaps some of the church music lingered still in his voice to idealize it for she heard no commonness there they were just man and woman for the nonce 
and if they could have remained at the height of a supreme moment of their lives lesser things would not have mattered at all but there is a to-morrow even after a moonlight night when we come back to earth and frank forgot it and so she said yes and felt very strangely tired and quiet that night when she went up to her little bed sitting-room and sat down to realize that her future was out of her own hands at last in the strange unknown keeping of a man whom she had only met six months since and who might be either gentle or rough but she could not tell and had trusted to fortune frank had gone to provincial duty in april she left in the following september and went back to the extension to wait for the move into st martin's le grand which she expected later on she had all the summer months in which to wander about the lanes with dick and idealize the moonlight and the wild rose hedges in her own womanhood while the man represented a peg on which to hang ownerless affections in after years that particular country town and its neighbourhood was always coloured for frank by the period of her life spent there for it is a pitiful fact that we can only see the beautiful earth through our own little mental mood the sun will shine in a million different ways for a million different people but the mere fact that the sun is shining however gloriously will not lighten the heart with a new grief in it to frank those hedges were always a memory to wince under and the wild roses had more thorns than petals yet she thought at the time that she was happy and when the day of her departure actually came and dick saw her off at the station in the abominable black coat and round hat which she always wore on serious occasions she cried a little and attributed it to him perhaps she cried over herself and a vague pain already menacing her from the future but even as he stood there leaning his elbows on the carriage door and thrusting his head into the compartment some shock of contrast to the well-known faces to which she was going back seemed to touch her like a cold wind give my love to mother said dick facetiously and tell her i'm coming to make her acquaintance the very first time i get a day out it was rather a favourite joke of his to speak of mrs peyton as mother which frank had carefully ignored even to herself for fear of feeling it a liberty it jarred now and her smile was a little more constrained than usual write to me won't you dear old boy she said gently and dick promised adding that she would soon get tired of seeing his fist he should write so often and then the train went off and frank heaved a sigh which she called regret but which sounded like relief she had not done more than hint of her engagement to her mother preferring to explain the drawbacks about which she was perfectly honest i have to live amongst such people it is better to accept fate and make myself one of them she said steadily and without the least snobbishness for a glance at dick relegated him to an undeniable class even in the eyes of the charitable and for all her unpretentious clothes and tired face frank bore another stamp quite as plainly it had seemed easy in the country to state her reasons for marrying this type of young man and she was proportionately surprised when she found herself explaining them rather hotly to her gentle mother who accepted the position with such perfect courtesy and kindness that frank suffered an unexpected pang oh mother dear it won't be any different she said in protest of she knew not what we can all live together dick understands that and you will only feel that you have got a big son at least she looked round the familiar homely room and faltered there was absolutely nothing of value in it even the water-colour drawings on the walls had been given by magda and were her own work but on the invalid couch by the little fire which frank had kept alight for so many weary years lay a woman with a face alien to dick's world a fleecy white shawl wrapped around her shoulders and one hand softly stroking the tabby cat who was lying on her knees yes dear said mrs peyton brightly and when am i to see dick then it blazed over frank 
that she did not desire her mother to see dick that the meeting she had steadily planned was a horrible incongruity not because they were any less poor than dick or that he would find an atmosphere unknown to him in the little room but because she would not have asked any of the tradesmen's boys or the shopkeepers round about to come and see her mother and because she had asked dick and dick was to be her husband in the future she turned mechanically to the fire as to a healthful duty with the shadow of defeat fallen upon her face the first of nous autres whom she met after her return to london was hilda romaine they met unexpectedly in the strand and frank had just time to admire the swing of hilda's advance before she saw who it was the tall young body and the grave greek face were upon her even as each recognized the other and hilda shook hands warmly why old girl i didn't know you were back you never told us she said reproachfully have you seen any of the others no i've been devoting myself to mother since i returned frank explained with growing difficulty every line of hilda's beauty seemed somehow to make the vision of a tow-headed young man at a carriage window more of a fading vision with something of the nightmare about it she felt indeed as if the whole incident of dick and her engagement had been engendered by a bad attack of indigestion and she began to be desperate i have some news for you she said with a forced brightness that struck drearily on her own ears i want to tell the others at our next meeting i'm engaged she hardly paused before she flung the whole matter down before hilda to a clerk in the post office he is in the same position as myself he is in my own station of life you know we have always agreed that nous autres should not go out of their sphere hilda hardly seemed to hear the piteous little justification my dear i am glad she said generously and the blue eyes warmed to the colour of violets what is he like who is he come in and have tea and tell me frank followed her into an a b c with a miserable reluctance and they sat down at a stained marble table and smelt the fumes of many teas already disposed of while awaiting their own the atmosphere of the place somehow reincarnated dick he was no longer a phantom frank remembered the ill-drawn outline of his face with sudden distinctness she saw again his badly chosen clothes and the hat that pressed out his ears even while her eyes rested on hilda's profile the same grave profile as the apollo belvedere's only fined down to a woman's the wide noble beauty of it cowed her he is not a gentleman hilda she said in the stress of the moment's truth not what we call a gentleman but he is a good fellow suggested hilda bravely oh yes after his manner he is the son of a small tradesman i can't see what one's parents matter said hilda with broad comfort it occurred to frank that it was hilda now who was giving the excuses must her relation with dick always be excused he has not risen so much above their class she said with an effort he is quite content with his position i think poor dick you must not expect too much hilda you must bring him to see us perhaps we may stretch a point and have him to one of our meetings said hilda kindly she did not say what was your reason for doing this but as if she felt the unasked question frank answered it hilda what do i matter i am of no importance to any one save myself number three one two in the telegraph extension a girl clerk marrying a boy clerk who cares when mother isn't with me any longer and you know it must come i shall be quite alone and i somehow i can't bear the loneliness any longer hilda we can't afford to know nice people every day nous autres sometimes one of the women whom we call the real girls will keep up an acquaintance with us and we visit them when we happen to possess a frock in which to go but every day and all day there is a class round us that we must meet on the level of an equal fight for bread and butter and those are the people with whom we live if we cut ourselves off from these we are alone 
hilda's lower lip took the proudest of its tender curves and that wonderful grave glance of hers went away from frank across the cheap hot tea-shop out to the busy strand where many grades of life jostled each other and all it seemed to her unlovely she saw the exaggerated face of an actor drift by the sharpened features of a newspaper man the nondescript london type of a london clerk no not this or this or this for her and yet as frank said if they turned from this their womanhood must go hungry then i will be alone dear she said in a low voice answering the stream of male faces beyond the cakes in the shop window as much as she answered frank i couldn't bear it said frank blankly you don't know what it was work all day and no one to speak to and the evenings with nothing to do and i'm not flair i can't live on myself and not lack for company one couldn't even go out and see things as one can in london and then dick came and so i took him and therein lies one tragedy of our sex which occurs daily said hilda in her heart for she saw all frank's disaster but aloud she spoke no word of dissuasion and that made frank more miserable still she was afraid to face the rest of nuzotra with her news knowing that she should meet the same hearty encouragement and feel the traitor in herself for as old ways and associations swung back upon her she lost touch even with the humanity of dick's personality the little refinements of living with an educated person which she had grown used to and taken as part of existence now started out oddly in contrast to something she had always known she should have to endure she had thought to influence dick and alter him to her own turn of thought in a measure and had comforted herself with the mutual taste for music even though she might not mitigate his physical drawbacks but a grim doubt began to make her heart sink more after each letter which she received from him he wrote the excellent hand of a clerk and his expressions were irreproachable even if they smacked of the elementary school but it was when dick became facetious that their natures sprang to alien spheres and once more frank experienced the appalling difference in senses of humour dick's jokes were of the kind that sees a wit in exchanging hats on a bank holiday they were not coarse because he was simply a young man emerging from the peasant class into the bourgeoisie and by no means vicious nevertheless frank found herself totally unable to do more than ignore them with courteous silence and began to look forward to his appearance in her home circle with actual dread it came at last that touchstone of a meeting for dick got his holiday in december and devoted a week of it to seeing london and frank his lady love was working into the late afternoons that week and could not even meet him and pilot him to the suburb where she lived she was obliged to drive through her day with blind misgiving and the hope that dick might not get to her home before her for everything seemed to hinder her leaving the office there were purple shadows under her eyes and a hunted look on her fagged face when at last she turned in at her own gate and opening the door with her latch-key learned that what she had feared had happened by a loud laugh from the sitting-room and a familiar voice grinding her nerves afresh i'll do it mrs peyton i'm quite a lady's man you know recognize a teapot from a warming-pan and boil the beans to the minute hasn't frank told you frank hasn't told any tales frank tried to say gaily from the hall as she pushed open the sitting-room door and entered the room her mother was lying in her usual place the table drawn up beside her with the tea-things and no change in the placid kindness of her manner dick had evidently been having a comic fight with the kettle at which he was pretending to spar and telling the spluttering spout that he wouldn't stand any of its nonsense don't you know he meant to have the tea made or he'd make it warmer than the fire for the delinquent mrs peyton was even smiling faintly at these efforts to amuse her as frank came forward 
but in a flash the girl's eyes saw the gentle worn face and figure as something set apart from the young man in a horrible suit of dittos which had been specially purchased as a compliment to his london holiday dick's ears did not seem to need the round hat to set them out to-day and his hair was preferable in its tow-like condition to being flattened with pomade as now he kissed frank noisily and she sat down rather limply as if the operation resembled the last straw which overtaxed the endurance of the camel that was a hideous tea-party punctuated with dick's rallying remarks a new form of his wit and her own heroic efforts to be cheerful and bright against the increasing silence which threatened to overwhelm her as a matter of fact mrs peyton did a surprising amount of the talking and dick had much to relate of the acquaintance and courtship until the i says tumbled out of his mouth in every sentence hasn't frank told you this didn't frank explain that he demanded oh i say frank do you remember trying to kid me about your not being sally that was cruel of you it was really had dick always said cruel for cruel had it really always been as bad as this in the lanes where the dog roses grew and in church she clung to the memory of his honest convictions and their talk of them as to a saving hope of grace when he left at last thank god she followed him into the little hall in her sweet-hearted remorse and kissed him as one asking pardon for the lack she found in him come again soon dear she said and and we will go about together mother is tired to-night or i would ask you to stay to supper good-night dick i'm sorry i have been so dull she watched him go out into the quiet suburban night and felt as if a greater loneliness took hold upon her after his departure yet it seemed an old pain now a part of her life which must have been accepted by her anyway there were not many things in frank peyton's life which it made her feel mean to remember but the time which dick spent in town had a furtive humour about it in her memory for all her life she made no settled plan of campaign but she asked dick to call for her at the office and contrived to introduce him to the girl who sat next but one to her in her division this girl was pretty in spite of the universal taste in blouses she had a well-coloured face that dick could understand and a style of badinage that matched his own frank felt herself machiavellian as she threw them more and more together herself acting third but the instinct of self-preservation rises above morality dick's twenty-three years made him susceptible but he fully appreciated his obligations with regard to frank and struggled against his dissatisfaction only urging her to dress her hair like pretty nelly and to buck up after the manner of that sprightly young lady until all frank's tired soul longed for the finale the week dick had meant to spend in town had however lengthened into a fortnight's discomfort before she ventured to suggest as softly as only a woman in the wrong can do that they had made a mistake at first dick would not hear of it he blustered of his own certainty with regard to his feelings and accused frank of being fickle then of being jealous then of being stuck up the only shaft that made her wince but it was so obviously his self-love that was wounded that she applied the balm of representing him to himself as only too attractive and is poor nelly to be unhappy because we can't be sensible and own that we are better friends than lovers she suggested in such adroit fashion that she felt ashamed of her own facility it took another half-hour to soak the flattery well into dick's mind but it was evident that it comforted him only at the end when he shook hands with frank and held hers in an honest grip he had almost invited her to his and nelly's wedding in a momentary expansiveness did she get a glimpse of the old glamour and felt her justification i was awfully fond of you frank he said and his eyes were honest if his lips were coarse you know we seemed such chums down at x that i fancied we should do well in a snug little house of our own 
just you and me together and let the world go hang yes dear she answered with a caught breath it did seem possible didn't it but it wasn't for me things have seemed different in london haven't they yes things have seemed different in london echoed frank well give me a kiss just to show there's no ill feeling old girl said dick nelly won't mind that you know frank put her hands on his shoulders and kissed him gently kissed good-bye to home and homely love and the little bearings and forbearings of every day that make up married life also but she had really parted from them on the day that dick first came to see her mother she could not have altered dick he had certain good qualities of the peasant nature in him but he had also the slow tenacity of the peasant brain frank would have gone down hill with him before she could have dragged dick up to a higher standpoint but down hill looks desirable to tired feet and though she knew that what she had done was inevitable she went straight into the sitting-room after dick had gone and sitting down on the floor by her mother's couch she buried her face against the invalid's gown mrs peyton's thin hand rested on the girl's tumbled hair in silence for a while but when at last she spoke her voice trembled a little with the first betrayal of infinite relief that she had shown is dick gone dear yes mother for good there was another pause and then the refined voice that was familiar music to frank's sensitive ears spoke again i am very glad that i need not lose my little girl after all even three one two in the telegraph extension department was a necessary personality here frank went back to the old life with its hopeless outlook and did not even sigh when nelly's face daily simpered into a nearer confession of bliss dick was one of many admirers to nelly but strangely enough the fact of his having in some sort belonged to frank seemed to give him an exceptional value in her eyes and his suit prospered it was not strange to nelly perhaps or to the rest of the department for it was only frank herself who felt so plainly her own unimportance that at times she seemed merely a unit drowning in the enormous size of a world which was so full and yet so empty for her it would have surprised her very much could she have realized the extent of her own influence in the circle immediately around her even when she had a momentary glimpse of such truth she found it hard to believe but she accepted it gratefully and humbly as a beautiful gift rather than the result of her own individuality one such glimpse came to dazzle her on the day that nelly appeared at the office with a new ring on her finger a small and yet rather pretentious ring with two corals and a pearl frank had worn no ring when engaged to dick out of respect for his pocket but nelly liked gods and she was of a shrewd mind with commercial instincts inherited from her immediate forebears she preferred to parade her appropriation even if it doesn't come off she added in her own mind and i dare say he will let me keep the ring anyhow frank did not see the new adornment on nelly's plump soiled hand however owing to a larger excitement she was working in the later day that week that is to say she went on duty at twelve and left at eight when she reached the office she was aware of newspaper boys running up and down cheapside yelling specials almost thrusting them into the hands of those snatching at them as eagerly in their turn of the whole live heart of the city stirred in some uncommon way there had been a victory on the other side of the world a victory that affected great britain and it was of a nature to be splendidly popular the civil departments of the empire at home and abroad are not supposed to be of a humanity that takes a keen interest in the success of the nation but as a matter of fact party feeling runs nowhere more high than in such little communities with an existence almost a world of their own such as the telegraph extension department the stock exchange is the best instance of this for its patriotism is not all due to the rise and fall of the markets 
and it is the first to break out and roar for imperial reasons and the last to be controlled for weeks the extension had been burning over the uncertainty on the other side of the world which had ended in victory now when frank entered she found the place in a ferment some one had brought in a paper and the news was known in vain the supervisors endeavoured to keep order in the groups and to regulate the work as usual the clerks male and female took advantage of the dinner hour to rush down to the refreshment rooms each division having its own demonstration that nothing could repress they took the chairs and mounted a special leader to start them and to keep time they sang the national anthem in crashing chorus and gave three cheers that could be heard in st martin's le grand where no doubt similar demonstrations were taking place take men and women and bind them down to labour in artificial light and stale air for eight to ten hours of their day you will drain the light and colour from their faces until to look at them you will think them poor mechanical things with all the vitality drained away but touch the old spark of racial pride in the meanest worker whom the relentless nation is grinding daily to help the empire's existence forward and the old life and light and heat will burst out in such ringing cheers as startled frank peyton on her entrance to the refreshment rooms that day they were waiting for her her own division had spared to begin until she should be there to give the note and greeted her with an eager buzz miss peyton we want you to start us and before she knew where she was frank was lifted on to a chair the group closing in on her with impatience a rush of feeling swept over her at the press of the shoulders round her the obedient lifted faces waiting for her voice and she recognized even in her modesty that she had some sort of a world here that she was not only one with these but had influenced them and was necessary to them she steadied herself with an effort and lifted the first pure strong note across the hot crowded room with a call like prayer god the voices caught the key and took up the national anthem save our gracious king but after the usual two verses and the pause during which they looked at frank to see if she were going on she drew breath and changed the strain to the old doxology praise god from whom all blessings flow the department had already sung the national anthem in various keys and rule britannia and soldiers of the queen but the unexpectedness of the doxology struck an instant response those who were not singing joined in so that most of the extension were swelling the chorus behind frank peyton's clear leading voice and a message from those in authority which came up to know the cause of the disturbance was answered breathlessly by the supervisors we can't hold the department sir no one just then could have held the department they pressed up round the chair where frank still stood looking over the clustered faces and singing with all her heart and soul as if she were one with the toiling men and women whose unlovely lives were like her own praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above angelic host praise father son and holy ghost some consolation out of the stress of daily life touched her a sudden acknowledgment from fate for all the cheerfully born days and hours and years during which the rights of her womanhood had been merged into mere mechanical existence she no longer grudged her lot she was one of a mighty nation whose individuality even in the unit can never be stamped out though she was merely frank peyton three one two of his majesty's telegraph extension leading the whole department in thankful praise for national victory. End of chapter 4